If you're trying to make any kind of meaningful, effective change in your life, you've come to the right place. Good day, ladies and gents. I'm Lori Bischoff, and we are about to talk shift. And first of all, today's menu selection, well, it's just going to be real simple, everyone. Today, we're talking about God, just God. We're going to talk about God, and we're going to talk about being happier than God. So before I tell you a little bit more about that, um, I do want to send an invitation out to you. If you are someone that has a tendency to just get a little bit bejiggity over the word God, um, and you feel like maybe this is not going to be your cup of tea, I would just invite you to um, just have an open mind and give it a try before you cut and run. Because I would just hate to have you miss out on the message and um, and the, the wisdom that is going to be shared here today, all because maybe you get hooked up on a word. Uh, I invite you to just swap that word out with one that you enjoy or are comfortable with for the, the God of your understanding, whatever it is, but hang in there with us because I think you're going to really love the special guest that I have on with me today who has had some pretty intimate conversations with God. So let's talk to Mr. Neil Donald Walsh. And before I let him start espousing, espousing all of his amazing wisdom. Let me just give you a little bit of background around Neil in case you're not familiar with him. Neil is a modern day spiritual messenger whose words continue to touch the world in profound ways. With an early interest in religion and a deeply felt connection to spirituality, Neil spent the majority of his life thriving professionally, yet searching for spiritual meaning before experiencing his now famous conversation with God. The Conversations with God series of books that emerged from those encounters has been translated into 37 languages. That's a lot. And he has touched millions, inspiring important changes in their day-to-day -day lives. Of the 37 books written by Neil on contemporary spirituality and its practical application in everyday life, seven of the books in that series reached the New York Times bestseller list and Conversations with God Book One occupied that list for over two and a half years. Neil's work has taken him all around the world and everywhere he has gone, Neil has experienced a hunger among the people to find Find a new way to live at last in peace and harmony. And he has sought to bring people a new understanding of life and God, of that, something that would allow them to experience that peace that, that everyone is so deeply searching for. Neil travels extensively, offering presentations focused on what he calls the most important question facing humanity today. Is it possible that there is something we don't fully understand about God and about life, the understanding of which could change everything? Hmm. That's a good question. Welcome to We're Talking Shift, Neil. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to share with your audience um, some some of what I think will be fascinating information. And I love what you said at, at the beginning, Laurie, that, that um, even for people, maybe even especially for people who have a pushback uh, to, uh, for, with the word God involved, uh, you might find this a fascinating uh, moment in your life because I had the exact same experience uh, because I couldn't understand. You know, if there really is a God, then why is the world the way it is? Somebody explain it to me, because because what's the point? What's the what's the good of having a god if there really is a god? If all we have is mayhem uh, of one form or another on this planet, and disruption and mayhem in our lives. So I you know I really sat down one day, uh, about twenty five or twenty six years ago, and I wrote an angry letter to God in which I asked those questions: What does it take to make life work, and why is life the way it is? Somebody just just tell me, I'll, you know, I'll play, I can play, just give me the rule book and I'll play. But, and, and by the way, after you give me the rule book, don't change it because everyone kept on changing the rules. First, yeah. it was okay to do this, then it was not okay to do that. Then it was okay to do that, but not okay to do this. And, 
And, and so the rules kept on changing from day to day, from place to place, from culture to culture. You know, prostitution is totally illegal in the United States, but if you go to the Netherlands, it, it's, it's actually a, a, a whole industry uh, taxed by the government and, and uh, considered to be a, a, a perfectly fine form of work. So, I mean, figure it out. You know, what's right over here, it's not right over there. Gay marriage, you know, what, whatever. Right. So some, somebody explain it to me. I, I need somebody to explain it to me. So that's yeah. when I began my conversations with God, Lori, when I, when I sat down and I wrote that angry letter. You know, yeah. just, just tell me how it works. I, I love that because I think a lot of people um, probably have the, the same questions bouncing around in their head, but, um, but for some reason don't actually do what you did, which is to, to sit down and have a very deliberate um, ask a deliberate ask of tell me this, answer me that, and then, and then be open to receiving what comes. So uh, I think that's probably something that makes your process so, so unique is, is you asked and, and maybe you were expecting an answer, maybe you weren't, but whatever it, it came and it's, and it kept on coming. So I feel like this is really, we're going to really be kicking off with your whole going rogue story, Neil. And, you know, I've, I've, um, I've read all of your books. I started reading them in, um, mm, gosh, early two thousands is when I was introduced to your books. Um, and you, were, bought... you, you were able to read my books when you were in the fourth grade. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes, exactly. Bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks to my, my beautiful mother um, who introduced me to all of my, my new thought spirituality beliefs and, and books. Um, she started, my sister and I, when we were um, pretty young uh, on that path, um, just sharing what she was learning. And, uh, and so eventually uh, when she came across your books, we all got copies and then all my friends got copies because I was so in love with them and shared them with everyone that I knew. Um, but, but I, uh, I also watched your, um, the movie that was done about your story, Conversations with God. Um, and I watched it again just the other day to refamiliarize myself with it. And, you know, I think it's kind of, um, uh, a good idea to just back up a tiny bit and let people know um, just briefly that, you know, at one point in your, in your life, I mean, you were clicking along like pretty much probably an average, an average Joe, you know, you were working and you were probably comfortable and had some measure of success. And then your world got turned upside down. You found yourself without a job and, and homeless for a period of time. You had a broken neck uh, while you were homeless. And, um, and then, and then, as you said, you got to this, ex you, you got to this extreme point of frustration and you just, you know, said, God, tell me wh what the heck, what am, what am I to do? What are the rules? So, um, did I get that right? Pretty much? Almost, um, almost, Lori. The sequence wasn't exactly, I, I, I didn't get, I didn't have a broken neck after I became homeless. It was the other way around. I became homeless because I had a broken neck. What happened was I was in a car accident. It's real simple. Okay. Okay. And, and, and uh, an older gentleman, uh, I say older because now I'm older, but at that time he was, <laughs> he was in his 80s, and he made a wrong turn. He turned right in front of me, and, and, but he crashed right into my car, and I had, my neck snapped. I could feel it snap. It just went, and my, I, had, I, had, I had a broken neck. Mm -hmm. And so they rushed me to the hospital, you know, and, and they put me in a Philadelphia, what they call a Philadelphia collar, which is a restraining device that, that you wear, and the doctor said, you must not take this off. Not to sleep, not to shower, at no time uh, are you to take this off at any time. It's to be worn 24 hours a day until I tell you that you're done with it, because right now, if you want to get an idea of what we're talking about, Neil, imagine a, a bowling ball being held up by a pin. That's, the, that's the, the analogy, because you have no support for your head at all if you take this collar off. Okay, so now I'm wearing the collar and I couldn't work. I, I was unable to do any kind of uh, uh, physical uh, work at all. They were telling me, uh, we don't even want you to reach out into the refrigerator to grab a half gallon of milk. Even a half gallon of milk at the end of your extended arm would be too much weight and, and you, you can't do that. So you have very limited in what you can do. 
well, you know, I got away with it for a while. I had some savings. I had a little money put aside. I couldn't go to my regular job anymore, but uh, so I was. But after I ran out of my savings, I was waiting for the insurance company to pay off because everyone agreed, including the police, including the insurance company. They all agreed that it was this gentleman's fault. I was not at fault in the accident, but you know, insurance adjusters they want to work with you to see if they can get the, you know, the, the money they're going to send you the claim reduced the amount of the claim. That negotiation went on for almost two and a half years oh. before we could finally agree on, on what uh, was an appropriate payment. In the meantime, I ran out of money and I couldn't pay my rent. I couldn't pay my bills. I wound up ultimately living literally on the sidewalk. I turned into a street person, just like that in my life. And I never thought, you know, I, I can remember thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. With my talent, with my ability, with my skills, and with my <coughs> good looks, <laughs> are you telling me I'm going to be sitting here on the street with no way to make a living? But I didn't have any way to make a living, and I finally wound up in a homeless park, a campground on the outskirts of the town where I live, where there were a number of homeless people, men and women, you know, kind of lying around. One or two of them had tents, and they were just, it was like a tent city and people were living in this homeless park, and that's where I wound up. And, but it, even the homeless park wasn't free. It cost $25 a, a, a month, which was next to nothing, but it was still $25 a month that you had to pay to the county for, to have a little, a little camping spot in that mm -hmm. park. Right. And I had no way, of, no way of even earning $25 a month. So I wound up going from person to person on the street, asking, you know, could you have, uh, a little charity in your heart. Could I have a dollar or two, maybe even a quarter or 50 cents? Because I had no money and no way to eat. Forget about paying the rent for the, for the campground, for the camping spot. I didn't have any even money to, to buy a bag of French fries. I had li literally down to zero, zero dollars. And I lived that way for a year, not for a tough week or a tough month, but for an entire year of my life. So I learned what it was like to be destitute in the truest sense of the word. I lived the great American nightmare. I'm living on the sidewalk and I'm walking down the street asking people if they could uh, uh, maybe spare a few dollars or a few coins. And, mm -hmm. and that's when I called out to God. I just, you know, I, I said, you know, God, what is it that I don't understand here? The understanding of which would change everything because this, this can't be the way it's supposed to be. I mean, I, I get people have bad luck. I mean, but, but come on, what's the formula? What don't I understand? Mm -hmm. And so I actually took out a, a yellow legal pad and I, and I wrote a letter to God. You know, it, it's, it's just an angry letter. Never, by the way, I never thought in a million years that anyone would ever see this, uh, this process would be, be, become part of this process. I, I didn't sit down to write a book. I was simply having a private experience, what we call journaling, Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you want to call it, in, in which I was saying, you know, dear God, I mean, really, dear God, what's going on here? And I wrote a very angry letter, very angry letter. And that's when I heard a voice uh, over my right shoulder. And I turned around, there was no one there, of course. I thought, oh, great. Now I'm on top of everything else. I'm losing my mind. But what, what I heard was, Neil, do you really want answers? Do you really, really want answers to all of these questions? Or are you just venting, just getting it off your chest. I said, you know, I said to myself, yeah, I am venting, but if you got answers, I'm all ears. I'd, I'd love to know what they are. And with that, I began receiving answers to every question I had written down on that yellow legal pad and to questions I never even knew existed because I was invited to ask other questions as well. And I wound up creating pages and pages and pages, over 250 handwritten pages of of notes on this dialogue that I was having. And I, it was like taking dictation. I would ask a question and I'd get the answer immediately. Is, and I would just write it down as fast as I could as if I was taking dictation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's the experience that I had. And then I had many, many, many pages uh, of handwritten back and forth questions and answers in this dialogue that I came to call my conversations with God. And Laurie, at one point in that process, I received the following message. It, it, I was told, you will make of this one day a book, and it will be read by many people. 
you'll make these messages available to many people. Now you have to know that my first thought was, yeah, of course, I'm going to send my middle of the night mental meanderings to a publisher, handwritten notes, you know, and he's going to say, stop the presses. This guy's talking to God. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. You know, but in fact, mm -hmm. that's almost exactly what did happen. They did read my handwritten notes. The, 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 the owner, it was a small publishing house, but they did publish about eight or 10 books a year. Uh, and and uh, the, the owner of the company read my notes and he said, we've got to put this out. And they, and they did put it out. They, they wanted to change the title. They did, they were, were very leery of the title to talk about people not wanting to talk about God or having yeah. a pushback to that phrase. They said, can we just change the title because conversations with God, were, you know, people are going to really have a tough time with that title. And I said, you know what? I'm sorry, but th that's how I experienced it. I experienced it as a conversation with God. And furthermore, I was told that we are all having conversations with God all the time. We're simply calling them something else. Women's intuition, an epiphany, uh, a, a brilliant idea, a sudden awareness. You know, we, we have all kinds of names that we use for this experience so that we are not marginalized and nobody calls us crazy. But in fact, in one form or another, they're all conversations with God and God is talking to all of us all the time. So I, I insisted, no, if you don't want to call the book Conversations with God, then, we'll, then we, we, won't, we won't have it published. And so they wanted to put it out. So they said, okay, you know, we're not going to sell many copies. Because, I mean, that's a tough title for people to swallow, but we'll put it out and see how well it does. Yeah. Well, they were right. It only sold 15 million copies in 37 <laughs> languages. Right, right. So, you know, so they had to, they took a risk too. something compelled them to do to do what their, you know, what their, I guess, initial reaction was telling them to back away from. And they were making an assumption that a lot of people would be resistant to that title. It's so interesting. And it was completely opposite. They took a chance. They kind of went rogue too. They took a chance. They did it like you requested. And here we are. Yeah. 37 um, languages later. And how many, you know, I lost track of how many books I, I've, there's so well, many. In, in the multi millions, I, I, I stopped counting, but many, many millions of copies sold in, in most, in all of the major languages of the world. And, and so uh, mm -hmm. there's nowhere I can go in the world now without running into people who have read the books. Sure. Do do you find that um, in different cultures, kind of going back to um, the beginning when we were saying how um, the word God, sometimes people get hung up on that. Now, if you are being, um, you know, translated into uh, all of these different languages and you're going to different cultures, different countries, um, what happens when people are coming up to you and talking about it as far as that thing goes do they do they like the reference god do they all just use their own reference do they have different um ways of connecting with it well sure you know a rose by any other name is still a rose and a god by any other name god brahman yahweh jehovah allah you know whatever word it pleases you to use to refer to that ineffable essence that is the divine but anthropological studies studies by people who look at what, what people are, are believing in uh, and recent ones, not old ones, but from recently, tell us that 8.5 uh, out of every 10 people statistically uh, believe in a higher power of one sort or another. We can't quite come together on an understanding of what that higher power is or how it's used or what it wants or what it demands or what it requires, but, but, but over 8 out of 10 people believe there's some higher power, something larger than us going on here in the universe. And so it, a belief in some kind of higher power is not unusual. And it turns out that by far, not a small majority, but the vast majority of people believe that there's something more here than meets the eye because the universe is far too sophisticated, far too complex. This couldn't all have been just random chance. Something is up. And it's up to us as a species of sentient beings to see if we can delve deeply into that and figure out what it is. Yeah, yeah. It seems like um, logically, not to mention just, you know, intuitively or, or 
you know, emotionally, but just even logically, it, it seems like there is some source for all of us and for everything that we are experiencing. I mean, there's, there's, there's got to be a cause and effect. There's got to be a, a first cause is is what it seems like so um yeah, yeah. first cause is a very good a very good uh, choice of words uh laurie first cause is exactly right even einstein who is not what you'd call a highly religious man was clear that me that uh, metaphysically speaking and from a from a, a standpoint of simple physics there had to have been a first cause of some sort or another and so he he agreed uh, with the religionists who said there is a first cause. He didn't agree with a lot of the doctrines and dogmas of those religionists, but he did agree that there was a first cause. And, and once we get closer and closer and closer to understanding, not only what that first cause is and was, but how to use it, how to yes. work with that energetic, then we uh, begin to unravel the, the greatest secret of all time. Yeah. So, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I, you know, in, in your book, Happier Than God, I'm going to just, for those watching us on YouTube, I'm going to hold it up. It's, you can see I've got lots of marks and uh, it's in, in bookmarks in it. Um, uh, using it is something that you talk a lot about in the book. Um, first of all, uh, let me just ask you this. Why? Why happier than God? Why not? Why not as happy as God or happy like God? Well, you know, it was a, it was a turn of phrase that 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 uh, I, I encountered in my conversation with somebody who was actually not talking about God. He was talking about a, a, a person he knew that he had met who was incredibly wealthy, very, very, very wealthy. And we were talking about this this other gentleman, and I said, "Well, you know, how much money does he have?" He said, "Neil." This guy's got more money than God. And I laughed at that. I thought, well, uh, but I totally understood what he was trying to say. Sure. He was trying to say that, that the man was, had more money than, than you could possibly imagine. Right. And so, he, so he used the phrase more money than God. So when I began to, when I began to, uh, to come to um, clarity about how we could find happiness in, uh, in uh, our lives, uh, I came up with the phrase happier than God as in more money than God, happier than God, meaning, meaning happier than you could possibly imagine, e even as happy as God is, and for that matter, actually happier than God. It was just a turn of phrase, mm -hmm. but I, I used it, and the publishers loved the title. They said, let's, let's put it out. So we called the book Happier Than God, which, means how, which, which talks about how we can be happier than you could possibly imagine. I love that. Um, and it definitely is an attention getter. So, okay. So back to um, how to, how to use this amazing energy and, you know, the source of, of everything to our advantage. So you do talk about um, the process of personal creation in the book and, um, and some people uh, liken that to the law of attraction, which has become uh, ever since the secret came out, you know, it's it's become all about the law of attraction. But which came out, by the way, after conversations with God, which is why they asked me to be in the movie, because yeah. I had already published conversations with God, and many of the metaphysical principles uh, espoused and uh, focused on in that movie uh, were exact. I'm not saying they came from the books, but they were certainly exact duplicates of yeah. what was contained in the Conversations with God books, which is yeah. why the producers of the film asked me to be in the film. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I think, um, you know, when I, uh, when I first heard about The Secret from, uh, from an acquaintance at the time, uh, she, was, she was very excited. This was all new to her. And she said, you have to watch this. And I said, okay. So I did. And I thought, well, this is delightful. But so many of these principles, as you say, um, were founded in um, new thought spirituality. And I think I had made my first vision board, which was called a wheel of fortune in 1987. Um, and I learned about that and the, the law of attraction. It wasn't called that then, but um, it, I learned about that from um, Catherine Ponder books, which were new thought spirituality books. Um, well, you, can, you can go back to 1947 to a man named Norman Vincent Peale. Right. And yep. this reverend, I might add, Reverend Norman Vincent Peale, a Christian minister who wrote an extraordinary book in 1947 
which sold millions of copies, by the way, called The Power of Positive Thinking. Yeah. So, yeah. And, it, and, it, and it even precedes him. It goes, you know, it goes, we're, we're yeah. talking about a principle in life that every spiritual teacher of note and all those who we have claimed to be spiritual masters have been talking about virtually from the beginning of recorded history. Yeah, and, it, and yes. So, I mean, James Allen wrote a little book called As a Man Thinketh. In, yep, got uh, it. In, 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 uh, yeah, in, in I think, uh, the, the, the 12th year of this past century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, yeah, in 19, 19, 1912 or something, he wrote the book as a man thinketh. So we've been hearing these ideas for hundreds and hundreds of years from many, many, many sources. Mm -hmm. As you believe it, so will it be done unto you. Have we been using the principle? Actually not. That is to say, not in large enough numbers has, to make right. a, a world of difference. Yes. So uh, what, I, what I love, though, about you know, the, the way that I learned about it, because it was from, from a, a, the, the, a spiritual source, um, and the way that you talk about it in the book, and you call it process of personal creation, but you bring in an element that isn't really talked about so much in The Secret, which is bringing in God or your, you know, whatever you want to call that, but it's bringing that into the process. Yeah, and, I call it God, and you're yeah, right, yeah. and and, and uh, that's why I only had about 90 seconds in the movie. It's really kind of funny. The producers asked me to be in the film, and you know, and I, I, I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So they came out to my house. Uh, they put a big camera up in my living room and all the lights. They took them like an hour and a half to set up, and then they did the interview with me. They had an interviewer there, and. And mm -hmm. the interview must have gone on at least an hour, if not a little bit more than an hour. And then when the movie came out a few months later, I was in the film. Yes, I was for about 87 seconds. I was just in and out that fast. Mm -hmm. uh, of all the guests they had in the movie, I was probably on screen the least amount of time. I wasn't ego involved. I didn't care about that, but I was kind of curious. Mm -hmm. So I, I called the, the producer and I said, uh, hey, you know, not from a place of ego, but just from a place of curiosity. You were with me for an hour or more, and all you got that, that you felt was worth showing in the film was uh, 90 seconds of what I had to say. I'm just kind of curious uh, about that. How did it come down to that, that most of what I offered was on the cutting room floor? And the producer said, you know the problem, Neil? The problem was every other word you, you, you used is the word God. You talked about God, 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 God. And the point of the film was you have all of this power within you. You don't have to depend on some exterior source. So you made the film sound like it was about some, ex some source exterior to you called God. And that worked against what we were trying to get across in the movie. So we had to cut down you know, uh, what you had to say. And since you used the word God in every other sentence, uh, we, 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 only, we could only find about 90 seconds of what you said that we could use. And that's why I wasn't in the film for more than about a, a minute and a half. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, what did you think about that? I thought, well, God damn them. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just having a good time. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I thought, well, they, they clearly don't understand. There's, there's something that they're not clear about here. Um, and that that what God is telling us in conversations with God is that the power is within you, but where does it come from? It comes from originally the source, yeah. and it comes which which I call God. Mm -hmm. So so you know we we had that little vocabulary uh, challenge, mm -hmm. but but it, but in fact uh, it was very clear to me that uh, they simply didn't understand that God is the source of everything, including all the energy that you could possibly want to use or focus in any particular way. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so, and you know what, I think um, being cut down to only, you know, 87 or 90 seconds probably hasn't um, hurt you in the least, Neil. I, well, I, I wasn't concerned about it. <laughs> I know you're not. I know you're not. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about... Um, how there's 
If you were to share with with people a little bit of the the missing aspect of that, you know, how would your process of personal creation differ just a little bit, or what would be added to the fundamental steps for the law of attraction, so that people that are listening now and uh, uh, you know. Clearly, we're in a crazy year, and, and there's a lot of struggle that people weren't anticipating, a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of desperation out there. So for people that um, are looking for something to, to grab onto, and they're open to trying something new, what can you tell them about, about the law of attraction or really, I should say, the process of personal creation from your well, perspective? Well, you, you know, uh, I, I would say two things. Uh, first, I would say that it has really helped me. Um, maybe I'm an old-fashioned person, but uh, I had a challenge imagining that all the power of the universe exists within me mm -hmm. and that I had within myself the power not only to change you know, certain aspects of my life, but by extension and by logic, uh, the power to change uh, certain aspects of life in general, that is life globally in my community, in my state, in my nation, in my world. Now, uh, when I saw the finished product uh, of the movie, The Secret, I was dismayed a little bit because it talked all about all the miracles they showed in that movie were like the guy gets to go out his front door and there's a brand new car in the driveway, the car he's always dreamt of. Then they shot, they cut to a shot of a woman and a diamond has appeared on her bodice. It's just an incredible diamond studded necklace. Like that was her highest idea. And then they even showed a seven year old or an eight year old boy, a child, all excited because there was a new tricycle outside yeah. the back door of his. Yeah. And it was all about stuff, 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 stuff. And there was what there wasn't there wasn't 30 seconds in the movie focused on world peace, finding a way to end the alienation of people on our planet yeah. uh, and, and, and bringing a different kind of experience to our life on Earth. Not there was not one minute was spent on that. So when I watched the movie, I thought, wow, mm. wow. So what's changed for me is two things. One my awareness of what God really is, that is, I think what the world is, is um, prepared for now, finally, is a new definition of God. That we, we need to redefine God. And, and, but I was a kind of an old-fashioned person, so I, I had a hard time imagining that all this power to, to not just create you know, a new car in my driveway for myself or diamonds for my wife or a new tricycle for my son, but actually have some sort of impact that could make it a better world in which to live. I couldn't imagine myself as being the source of that, but I could imagine that there may be some source that's working it with me and through me. I could imagine that there were other people in the world, in uh, Earth's history and on the planet even today, that, 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 that source is working through who are inspired enough to believe in uh, the ultimate source of all that is in the universe that I call God. So I thought, you know what, for me, it was easier. So what changed for me was I'm an old fashioned person. So what changed for me is I began to use the tool of imagining not that God is separate from me or outside of me, but that God is part of what I am, but that there is a thing called God that is imbued in and part of everything, every sentient being in the cosmos, not just the sentient beings on earth, but the sentient beings on all the other planets as well. And when I began to, to conceive of God in that way, it was easier for me to call upon that power and to allow myself to become participants in the spreading of it and the focusing of it and the sharing of it and the projecting of it. Then, because then I didn't think, oh, I'm projecting my power. Right. I kneel. I'm going to change, you know, this or that. Yeah. But I could imagine, okay, God is going to change this or that using me and working through me, mm -hmm. even as God has worked through every other uh, messenger on the earth. And so that's what changed for me uh, from the uh, so-called power of positive thinking angle 
this, you know, this idea that, you know, as you think, so will it be. Mm-hmm. I began to rearrange my understanding and, and take a closer look at how the energy of life works uh, and expresses itself through, through our process of life itself. And what I was told in the book, Happier Than God, is that life expresses itself in five distinctly different ways. The energy of attraction, the law of opposites, the gift of wisdom, the joy of wonder, and the presence of cycles. And when that was explained to me very simply, with almost one or two sentences for each of those categories, suddenly I really got what the power of personal creation was and how it could work and how it was working, whether we, whether we wanted to or not. Mm-hmm. You know, what I, what I, what I learned, uh, what I learned, Lori, is that the power of personal creation is on all the time. It's, it doesn't turn on when you ask it to be turned on. It's constantly on. And so when we understand, oh, I see, there's no time when the power is not working. It's, there's only a time when we are not consciously using it creatively. We're, and so it turns out that as I observe my own life and the lives of others as well, probably 60 or 70 on a bad week, 80 or 90% of the time, we're creating unconsciously yeah. without even knowing that we're doing it with, you know, with, with random thoughts, random statements, random ideas and beliefs that, that do not serve us and that in fact actually disserve us. So I began to, which, which the shift that happened in my life, uh, when we talk about shifts, because you know, I always, my, my favorite saying when I did do lectures is folks, shift happens. That's our jam here, that's yeah. it. Shift We're happens. Shift. So, mm-hmm. so, how, how, so the shift that happened for me is I began to get a sense that uh, the energetic could be used consciously not unconsciously. So I began to pay very close attention to what I was thinking, what I was saying, and what I was doing, how I was physicalizing the energy that I was thinking about and talking about. Uh, And I I had, I gave up um, thinking unconsciously or saying, I even watched little phrases that I would use, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I always, you know, uh, with my luck, I used to say, Things like, well, with my luck, I probably won't even be able to find a parking space. Yeah. That kind of, I, mean, I use a lighthearted example, but yeah. just to give you, and I would, make, I would make statements like that. And I suddenly stopped saying that because God was saying to me in my head, why, why do you say that? As you speak it, so will it be done for you? Why would you say that? Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't you hold a, a different point of view, whether it's about something as simple as a parking space or something as wonderful as peace on earth? Why wouldn't you decide to hold a different point of view? And that's what I got as my answer. When I ask God, why doesn't, why doesn't life work? What does it take to make life work? <laughs> God said, you want to know what it takes to make life work? I said, yes, I do. She said, I'll give you one word, what it takes to make life work. You. It takes you. You can't yeah. step by and expect it's all going to happen. It's just like, like the passing parade, like a, you know, a, a bystander standing on the curb watching the passing parade. You, whether you know it or not, Neil, you are at the front of the parade. You're leading the parade. As you think, as you say, and as you speak, and as you act, so will it be done to you and through you for all those whose lives you touch. And then here is is one one last thing. Don't get me started, because if you ask me a question, you're going to find out, Laura, you're going to ask me a 30-second question, and I'm going to give you a two-hour answer. Hey, you're a conduit. You are a conduit for God. So I'm just going to let we it all are. We, 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 we all are. But, but let, let me say the one, the one last thing I wanted to say, yeah. because, because people often ask me, what is the single most important message you ever got in all of your conversations with God? And, I, and I, my answer is always immediate, because, because it was very clear to me that it was a, a life-changing uh, statement that was given to me. I ask God, what does it take to make my life work? What is it that I don't fully understand here? The understanding of which would change everything. And I can remember God's voice almost chuckling, not derisively, but the kind of joyful chuckle that you would, that you would have with a, with a three or two year old child, you just kind of chuckle at, at the beauty and the wonder of their innocence. And she said, <laughs> oh, Neil, sweetheart, it's so simple. It's so easy. 
You think your life is about you. And your life has nothing to do with you. It's about everyone whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. But when you understand that, you will realize that in the broader sense, in the larger definition, of course your life is about you because Neil, there's nobody else but you. Everyone else is just you in another form. There's only us, Neil. There's only us. One day I'm gonna write a book, There's Only Us. There you go. You, you heard it here, folks. That's the next one coming out. <laughs> but you know what? That's, that's perfect because, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about here was um, part of that in the book. Uh, it says there are really only two basic questions to ask in life. One, what can I give to another? And two, what can I give to myself? And then you say, uh, and it is important never to reverse the order of those questions. Don't reverse the order of the questions. That is important. I want to talk about that a minute because in, a, in, a, uh, in an age where we hear a lot about um, all about me time and self-care and all of that good, good stuff, but how do people not confuse that um, with... Um, you know, what can I give to myself after the question of what can I give to another? I reversed it by realizing, by coming to clarity that what I was told by God was true, that what I give to another, I actually do give to myself. And that the more I give to another, the more I give to myself. The more I give to others in my life, uh, loved ones and even total strangers, uh, the, the world at large, if you please, the more I outpour the energetic that is me, the better I feel about everything, the more joyful, the more powerful, the more wonderful, that is the more filled with wonder, the more of a sense of who I really am, and, and the more, gosh, abundance, clarity, wisdom, I feel as I see that, oh, I see, I see why I'm here. I'm here to remember and to remind everyone else of who they really are. And in doing so, I wind up talking to myself and really experiencing what it is that I'm sharing with others at the next highest level. So I realized then that the magic of being there for others is that I was being there for myself as opposed to the old days when, it, when, it, when, I, when I was a very selfish person, that I, that I could. Um, I was, I was there largely, I won't say exclusively, but largely in the majority of times, I was out after what I could get for myself. Not in a mean or terrible way, but I was, of course, looking after myself. Let me explain. We're all adults here, Lori, so I'm sure our audience is adult enough to hear me use a sexual reference. When I was a young man, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 25, 27, my idea of a sexual interlude of a romantic uh, um, encounter had to do, not in the main, but largely with my own joy, my own satisfaction, my own excitement, my own process, if you please. It was my own involvement. What could I get out of it? It was only uh, until I, when I became a, an older gentleman, thank you very much, and I won't tell you what, how long it took me to learn that, but it, was, it, it wasn't when I was 18, I can promise you that. But, but, but later on in my uh, adult years, I began to realize, oh, wait a minute, w w wait a minute. There's more going on here than meets the eye. Excuse me, but there's another person in the room here. And really excuse me, what if I was here having nothing to do with myself? What if my purpose in having this particular encounter with another human being which we call a romantic interlude, was not about me at any level. What if it was all about her? I mean, from beginning to end, about no one else but her. Would that shift the experience in any way? I hate to tell you this, but the answer is fairly predictable. <laughs> of course it did. Yeah. And I realized then that it not only shifted the experience for my partner, 
of course, for me as well. If I thought I knew about sexual ecstasy before, I, I, knew, I realized I knew nothing until I realized what I was doing in the room, until I decided it, that it needed to have nothing to do with me whatsoever. And that as you give to another, so do you give to yourself because there's only one of us here. And that's my wonderfully romantic idea of human sexuality in this day and age. And I want to say it goes past human sexuality. Yeah. It goes past, it goes into our huge, um, a large part of life, our financial life, our emotional life, uh, our physical life, every aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. So it turns out now, you know, I, I mean, you know, the kind of male that I used to be, <laughs> Such a chauvinist. When I would go, when I would go into the kitchen, you know, when I was in my thirties, you know, I'd go ahead. Maybe I'd wash a few dishes. I thought I was doing a favor for my sweetheart. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, know your type. Oh, help me out! <laughs> and only when I when I grew up mm -hmm. did I realize, as I was sitting there one day washing the dishes, oh, I'm doing this for myself. And look at the feeling that I am feeling about me, through me, as me, because I'm doing what I used to think was a favor for somebody else. So I'm giving you simplistic, silly yeah. examples, but I'm trying to expand on this to say, when you live our whole life with that point of view, what I do for you, I do for me. And what I fail to do for you, I fail to do for me. When we understand that, then we have found the key to being happier than God. Because that's exactly how God feels. I need nothing. Neil, really, do you think I need something from you? I need nothing from you. I have no requirements of you, no commandments to issue to you, no demands, no expectations, not even any hopes. I simply want to give to you. Do you know how wonderful it makes me feel to give to you? Because I realize, of course, that by giving to you, I'm giving to me. Because guess what, Neil? You are me individuated mm. you're simply an individuation of divinity i love that yes i couldn't agree more and i want to circle back around so i don't lose it and ask you to talk a little bit about the law of opposites Yes, well, uh, I was saying earlier that life expresses itself through the energy of attraction, which gives us power, and the law of opposites, which gives us opportunity, and then the gift of wisdom, which gives us discernment, and the gift of wonder, which gives us imagination, and finally, the presence of cycles, which gives all of us eternity. Now, the law of opposites is really quite simple. And it was explained to me uh, in uh, the, the, the book, Happier Than God, and of course, that explanation was drawn from my dialogue in conversations with God. And here's how the law of opposites works. God said to me, Neil, in the absence of that which you are not, that which you are is not. What? I said, what? I'm sorry, would you run that past me again? She said, sure. Here's how it goes again. Take it down. Take it down. In the absence of that which you are not, that which you are, is not. That is, it's not experienceable. So when it's reduced to its most simplistic terms, we see that in the absence of big, small is not. In the absence of fast, slow is not. In the absence of there, here is not. In the absence of that which you are not, that which you are is not. So, you know, I like to think of myself as a good person, a kind person, a gentle person. But if there was nothing else but good, kind, gentleness all around in the entire universe, how would I be able to experience myself? God explained this to me in a simple, um, an, uh, um, I, would, I don't want to say an analogy, a little a children's story. It's the story of the little soul in the sun. I'm going to tell the story to you now, and I hope you don't mind me sharing the story with you. Nope. But God, shared, God shared it with me. And here's how the story goes. Once there was a little soul. And he's, he said to God, I know who I am. God said, that's wonderful. Who are you, sweetheart? And the little soul said, I'm the light. God said, that's right. You are the light. But the little soul said, but, but I want to just be the light. I don't want to just know that I'm the light. 
I want to actually be the light. I want to experience myself as the light. And God said, well, we can arrange that, but there's a little challenge. Always a challenge, said the little soul. What's the, what's the challenge now? God says, sweetheart, it's really very simple. But you can't be the light when you're amidst the light. Right now, my son, you are like a candle in the sun. You are one of a million, kajillion, kazillion different candles that make up the sun, to use a metaphor. You can't see yourself or experience yourself as the light when you are amidst the light, one of a zillion candles in the sun. In order for you to experience yourself radiating as the light, you must find yourself in the what? In the darkness. In the darkness, which is what you are not. But in the absence of what you are not, that is in the absence of the darkness, what you are, which is the light, cannot be experienced. Therefore, in the moment, in the very moment that you call upon yourself to experience yourself as the light, you will become aware of the darkness. You will become suddenly sensitive to that which is not who you are, so that you might become experiential, you might be able to experience that which you are. Therefore, therefore, Raise not your fist to heaven and curse the darkness not, but be a light unto the darkness that you might know who you really are. And bless, bless, bless your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and allow yourself to know who they are because they are like the little soul in the sun. So I said to God, the little soul said, well, how can I, how can I, I, I want to be the light. God said, what, what part of the light do you want to be? And, and, and the little soul said, I want to be, um, I want to be love. I want to be, I want to be the, the, the part of the light, the light that we call love. God said, wonderful. But now who will you love? Will you love only those who love you? Or will you love those who don't love you? When you love those who don't love you, and when you love those who give you nothing, and when you need nothing, ask nothing, require nothing, hope for nothing from those you don't love, and still give love to those, then you will have understood who you really are. Then you will have experienced yourself as loving. So the little soul made a friend of the friendly soul. And the friendly soul came along and said, I I I'll play with you in the next lifetime. H how, about if, how about if I do the most dastardly thing you could ever possibly imagine? And then you can love me, you can forgive me. You, you can be there for me in that way. And the little soul said, you would do that for me? Wow, you, the perfect radiant light that you are, you would allow yourself to be less than the light so that I could be the light? You'd give me a chance to be who I really am. And even at the, at the loss of who you are. And the friendly soul said, sweetheart, you've done the same for me. We've lived lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Surely you don't think this is the first time we've crossed paths. And the last time you were the villain and I was the victim. Remember then? So this time when I come in through your lifetime and I play the villain and you play the victim, do me one small favor, one small favor. Anything, said the little soul, I get to be the light. I get to be loved. What can I do for you? And the friendly soul said, in the moment that I do the most dastardly thing you could imagine, remember who I really am. said the little soul, I will remember. Hmm. All the world's a stage. And the people but the players each carry their entrances and exits and each playing many parts. Yes. To be or not to be, that is the question. 
whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to rise up against a sea of troubles and by opposing to end them. Mm -hmm. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, why, there's the rub. So much to talk about, Neil. Okay. Shakespeare is my favorite metaphysician, by the way. Ah, so much brilliance there, and uh, amazing how... Um, it was he yeah. who said, by the way, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Yeah, it's pretty deep. It's pretty deep. I wonder how many lifetimes he's had. Hmm. All right, let's talk about... Let's, what, oh. what, I want to add one last sentence, if I may, Lori. Yes, when the sure. opposite, when the opposite, it becomes apparent to you. When it, uh, mm. I want to say, shows up in your life, don't condemn it. Welcome it. it, it allow it. I don't mean welcome it, yeah. you know, by wanting more, but just say, right. ah, I see what's happening. I see what's happening. Yes, don't resist. Yes, because what you resist persists. And what you look at disappears. That is, it ceases to have its illusory form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that back up because I did have a note about that. Um, I love the phrase um, when you're talking about the law of opposites that you say, do not oppose, compose. Compose who you really are. And use that moment as the moment of your composition that you compose, you know, the old saying, oh, compose yourself. Come on, Neil, compose yourself. In fact, in fact, compose yourself. And while you're about the art, the, while you're about the act, activity of composing, compose the most wonderful symphony that you ever played. Compose yourself. And then you can decide who you really are. What if life had only one purpose in the end? That each moment was marvelously designed, perfectly designed, to allow us to decide and to declare, to express and to fulfill, to become and to experience who we really are. This, excuse me, I don't want to, I don't want to cross a, a boundary here that might be uncomfortable for some people, but isn't this exactly what Jesus did? Isn't this exactly what Buddha did? Isn't this exactly what Moses did? And all the great leaders, male and female, of the world's great faith traditions through the centuries, this is what they did. They used the moment at hand to announce and to declare, to express and to fulfill, to demonstrate right in front of our eyes who they really are and who you really are. And when people marveled at what all of them did, each gave us the same message, each in their own way. I love the words of Jesus on this topic. When they would marvel at what he was doing, he would turn to them and say, why are you so amazed? These things and more, these things and more shall you do also. I thought about that a lot over the years and, and I wondered why more people don't do that. Because they don't believe it. It's, you, know, you know, I asked God the question. I said, you know, I asked God that exact question. God said, Neil, you want the answer? It's the irony of ironies. God's message is simply too good to be true. But if I can't be too good to be true, who can? Is what God said to me. I had to chuckle a little bit at that. And I said, okay, you got me there. You got me there. God said, don't I wish. Don't I wish that I really got you there. But if you stick with me, I'll get you there. Neil, most people, I think, would, would love to have a private conversation with God. And I know you said we are all the time. We just maybe are not aware of it. But how... Or we're calling it something else. We, we may oh. actually be aware of it. We just call it something else. Women's intuition. I love right. It. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. If, if somebody doesn't seem to have much experience with um, listening to their intuition or any of the other ways that we know would be, you know, a, having a conversation or a dialogue with God, you know, how would you guide people to have this conversation, but be able to 
discern the difference between a conversation with God and our own like mental mind chatter? How do okay. they tell the difference? Well, uh, there's a little five part, because um, I've been asked this question many times, and I, 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 therefore I've been required really to think about, you know, really what is the answer to that question? And, and, and how, do I, how, how do I allow myself to, to have that experience on an ongoing uh, basis, almost on demand? Mm -hmm. And I, so I came up with like a step-by-step a, a -step process. Step number one, we have to believe it's possible. That's number one. We have to believe that there is a God, or if you please, a source of higher wisdom and greater power than us individually in the universe. So we have to believe that's the first step. If you don't believe that, that, that there is a God, uh, then you obviously can't have a conversation with God. Step number two is to believe that God would converse actually with human beings, that with, that, that not just with the Pope, you know, or, or certain holy people, you know, a, a select few throughout human history, but that God, in fact, would, would communicate that the source of wisdom and clarity uh, would interact, if you please, with all of us, with every sentient being on the earth and every sentient being in the cosmos. Step number three, we have to believe that we, of all those beings, are worthy as well, worthy enough individually to receive that kind of inspiration uh, from the divine. And that, and that in fact, it's not coming to us from another source. Step number four would be to, for us to understand that really the source that we're talking about lives within us and has been placed inside of us. And, and uh, I was given an allegory uh, by, by a God in my conversations uh, to help me understand that. She said, Neil, look at the tree outside the window. Okay, there's a beautiful oak tree out there. And, and God said, now, now, when that tree was no bigger than a seed, a seed, no bigger than the fingernail of your little finger, uh, I want you to know that it knew all that it needed to know to become that mighty oak outside of your window. It has learned nothing uh, through the years that it's taken for it to grow into that mighty oak. The tree hasn't learned anything. Everything it needed, everything it was required for it to become what you now see in its fulfillment was encoded, if you please, mm -hmm. in that seed. And if I love the tree that much, don't, don't you think I would love you at least, at least that much? Well, I thought, I, I suppose it's possible. But God said, possible? So here's what I want you to know. I planted in the seed that you call you everything you need to know to be the most wondrous, blossomed expression of life that you are and have become, and that you can become more of, for this is the purpose of life itself. So you have nothing to learn. Neo, life is not a school. Get that idea out of your head. You're not here to learn anything. It's not a school. You're here to remember. It's a process of remembering who you really are. And so I came to clarity around how all of that works. And it was just a remarkable insight uh, in, in my life. Mm -hmm. So is that the purpose of life, remembering who we are and who the everyone purpose, else is? The, the purpose of life, as I understand it, is to recreate ourselves anew, brand new, in every golden moment of now, in the next grandest version of the greatest vision ever we held about who we are. In a word, evolution. That the purpose of life is for us to evolve and to become more and more of an expression of our true identity. That God may know itself in, as, and through us. That's my understanding of the purpose of life. And, and since I have embraced such a notion, I have used the moments of my life for that purpose and focused on that reason. That's become, as the French would say, my raison d'etre, my reason for being. Do I, do I always achieve it? Of course not. Do I achieve it most of the time? Actually, not even most of the time. But do I achieve it more now than ever I did before in my life? Absolutely. And has it changed my life amazingly for the better in every possible way you could imagine? Yes. 
even if you, I have found out, even if you just start off on this path, your life begins to change remarkably, virtually overnight. And all the things I dreamed of when I was a young man have come to me. I'm not bragging, just announcing, virtually without effort. This is what heaven is all about, heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And this is what we've been promised. I mean, he said it to us. Great teachers, again, each in their own way, have said it to us. Don't go around asking, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? Wherewithal will we clothe ourselves? How are we going to survive? No, no, no. God said, no, 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 no. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And all this stuff will be added unto you. I could, of course, be wrong about all of that. But I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think you are either. So before I let you go, Neil, I have one more question. Um, before I ask it to you, though, I do want to make sure that um, we tell everyone where they can find you and all of the amazing things that you have to offer. Um, I have your website as cwg.org. That's the website for my nonprofit organization. If you want to get in touch with me personally, mm -hmm. uh, you can get right to me at cwgconnect.com. CWG, that's of course for Conversations with God. So if you want to stay connected with me, you want to go to cwgconnect.com. There I have a column that I visit twice a day, sometimes three times a day. It's called Ask Neil, and you can ask me the kinds of questions that uh, we've been discussing here or okay. any other thing you'd like to talk about. And uh, I respond individually to each person who writes in there. Beautiful. And I know we can find you on Facebook. I have um, the Conversations with God Foundation is on Facebook. Is there another Facebook page too? Yeah, Neil Donald Walsh. Okay. At facebook.com. Right. Okay. And then we have Twitter at Real N D Walsh, correct? Yes. All right. YouTube, the CWG Foundation? Uh, possibly. I don't even know. I can't keep up with all this electronic <laughs> stuff anymore. It's all too <laughs> sophisticated for me. You know what? Neil Donald Walsh is not a hard man to find, you guys. So anyone that wants to find Neil and his, his books and all of the amazing things he has to offer, you will not uh, have to go far to find any of it. Um, and we will put links in, of course, the show notes as well. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah, in Conversations with God, if, for people that are just not big readers, you know, it's all, everything is on is on get a book on tape, get audible. Um, and then the movie conversations with God about Neil's life is so fascinating about, you know, his life leading up to this whole um, experience with the dialogue. Yeah. I got a call one day from a man named Stephen Simon. The phone rings. He said, and, and Mr. Walsh was at, yeah, he said, my name is Stephen Simon. I produced a couple of films. You might remember, uh, maybe you've seen a couple of them. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, uh, What Dreams May Come. And he listed off a whole bunch of movies he's produced. I said, yeah, I've seen several of those. He said, we want to do a movie on your life. I said, you're, you're kidding me. He said, no, we want to bring up a film crew to the city where you live in Oregon. And we want to do a, a movie of your life. We'd like to cast it and have a person play the role of you when you were a younger man and mm -hmm. all the rest. So they did. They did, in fact, make that movie. And yeah. it was a very, very sweet film. Oh, it was, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful film. And um, it was cast perfectly. Uh, I just, I thoroughly have enjoyed it. And I know, I mean, I still have the DVD. I got it so long ago, um, but I know it's on Amazon and I think you can watch it on YouTube now as well. Um, but I, I highly recommend um, listeners for you to yeah, check you it out. You can watch it on Netflix as well. Netflix too. Excellent. Okay. So there's a bunch of questions that I did not get to. So I'm hoping that you'll agree to come back, but I do have one more. Couldn't um, keep me away if you tried. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Cause I wanted to touch a little bit about reincarnation. I wanted to touch a little bit about, um, um, holographic universe and, and holograms. I mean, there's just so much. I wanted to talk about having only preferences and, uh, shifting from addictions to preferences. There's just, way too much but 
But if you'll come back, I'm going to save those. So I want to wrap it up with inviting you to share. Um, let's see. If you had the opportunity to cut a 30 second, okay, you can have a few more seconds if you want, but approximately a 30 second commercial right now to give a message to Americans. Oh, you can be global if you want to. I won't give you too many rules. What, what right now would you share with everyone? What's the message today? There is an opportunity that you have to touch the world in a way that could create true shift in the lives of others. Never believe that one person cannot accomplish such a wonderful task. Every major change that has ever occurred on this planet began with a single human being who decided, if not now, when? If not me, who? So I would invite you to wake up each morning and ask yourself that question. If there was something that God wanted the world to know or to understand or to experience more deeply today through me, what would it be? And if you go through the rest of this day, the rest of this week, the rest of this month, this year, and the rest of your life, with that as your goal, with that as your intention, I promise you, you will touch the world and the lives of others in the way that they will never forget. And your own life will be enriched beyond anything you could possibly imagine. In fact, your whole life will turn out to be, if you're not careful, a conversation with God. Ah, beautiful. Just beautiful. You know, everyone, um, I, I really, really encourage you to pick up Happier Than God or any one of Neil's books. I, I promise if you have an open mind, they will change your life. Um, they're full of not just theory and concepts, but really down to earth, practical information to help you just figure out how to suffer less and be happier. It's really not as complicated, I think, as we tend to make it. Um, anyway, Neil, thank you so much for all of your time today. You've been so gracious, and I cannot wait to have you back on. Everyone, thank you for hanging out with us today. Uh, if you find value in what we talked about today um, and you love everything you've been hearing, please leave us some comments. Let us know uh, what you loved, your takeaways. Make sure to share all this good shift with people because we don't want to hoard it and be greedy and keep it to ourselves. Spread it around. Um, give us some ratings and reviews and that helps other people uh, to feel like, ooh, they're missing out on something. They got to check it out. So until next week, my friends, stay healthy and go make some epic shift happen in your own lives. You too, Gary B. 